What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. As always, I've got my producer, Joel, here with me as well. And today we're going to be covering probably one of the most evil individuals to have ever walked this earth. And that is Adolfo Constanzo. This guy is known as the leader of the narco Satanists and was responsible for the very brutal Matamoros cult killings. So a lot of different things going on with this episode today. And just for a warning, this is a very graphic episode. Lots of very descriptive details in this one. So just a heads up there. But before we get into this episode, I wanted to mention that our merch is actually on sale even more than it was previously. We got a few items left. We're just trying to clear house. Everything's 30% off. So if you haven't checked out our merch, it's milehighmerch.com and you'll see lights out. Just click it and there's still a few items left. So if you want something from the first merch drop, you only got a little bit more time to do that before we're all sold out. But also this episode is brought to you by our wonderful sponsors, Every Plate Blenders and Stamps.com. So let's not waste any more time because we got a lot to cover today. But this is the absolutely brutal story of Adolfo de Jesus Constanzo. And before we begin, I just want to let everybody know, as you probably can tell, Spanish is not my native language, so please bear with me. I'm going to do my best to pronounce. There's a lot of places and names here that are Spanish, and I'll do my very best to get it right. I do have the pronunciations, so I'm not just going into this without any sort of guidance on this, but please be kind. So Adolfo de Jesus Constanzo was born on November 1st, 1962 in Miami, Florida. His mother, Dahlia Gonzalez, was 15 when she had Adolfo. She was a Cuban immigrant who had escaped the Cuban Revolution. She'd actually married a few times and eventually had three more children with different men. But Adolfo was always her favorite. Dahlia took Adolfo on trips throughout his childhood, introducing him to many different cultures. For a while, they actually lived in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and she also liked to take him to Haiti. Adolfo was actually baptized in the Catholic Church and even served as an altar boy. But his mother really raised him in a belief system she learned in Cuba called Palo Mayumbo. Palo is one of the primary Afro-Cuban religions, and it's an older, darker religion than the more well-known Santeria. When people were brought from African tribes to Cuba as slaves, aspects of their beliefs were mixed with Christianity. They believed their gods traveled with them through objects, so they attached their gods to Christian icons, like saints, to hide them from the slave masters. They worshipped their own gods in plain sight, but looked like they were following Christianity. Like Christianity, they believed in an afterlife, or a spiritual realm. But unlike Christianity, human existence wasn't about getting to an afterlife. They were more focused on the present. And for most practitioners, this means doing good deeds. And they use a religious practice to improve people's lives. But in the wrong hands, focusing on the here and now can get pretty dark. And greed and instant gratification can take over. There are many deities in these religions. And one of the main concepts involves animal sacrifice to these deities. Each god has a different focus or power, and practitioners perform specific rituals and sacrifice different animals in order to get certain results. The details of these rituals are kept highly secret, as there's no rule book or sacred text to follow. All the information is passed down by word of mouth. And in order to learn, you need to be chosen by a current practitioner and taught everything they know. It takes years of studying to be able to perform these rituals correctly. And according to Paolo, all objects have their own power, and through rituals these powers can be used for different purposes. One of the most powerful objects are sticks from trees, and these are used as kind of a communication system between humans and the spirit world. Paolo has different denominations, and one of the darkest is Paolo Mayumbo. When Adolfo was very young, he started learning about Palo Mayumbo, an animal sacrifice. His earliest memory was the gurgling death rattle of a chicken's slit throat. 
His mother Dahlia was a follower of Haitian Palero in Miami. And a Palero is a male practitioner of Pio Mayumbo, basically like a priest. And a woman is called a Palera, but women are often considered spiritually weaker than men and aren't allowed into the inner circle. No one knows the real identity of this Palero, but what we do know is he was a practitioner who used the power of the religion for evil and not good. And he believed the way to increase his power and wealth was by causing suffering. One important thing to keep clear though is that Palo, just on its own, is not inherently evil. There's many ways to use Palo and many people use it for good. I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions in just the world of magic and the occult is that anybody that performs spells or does rituals are inherently evil and that's just incorrect. There's all types of ways to use it for all different purposes. So before you judge it, take a little bit of a closer look and figure out what's really going on. So Adolfo's mother, Dahlia, brought him to this Polero when he was just six months old. And during this meeting, the Polero announced that baby Adolfo was the chosen one and that he was destined for greatness. And this Polero agreed to be his padrino, which translates to godfather. And in this context, basically means teacher. To other practitioners, a lot of what the padrino taught Adolfo defiled the sacredness of the religion. Palo Mayumbo doesn't have human sacrifice, for example, but Adolfo was taught that human sacrifice is the most powerful of all. Leaders also can't be homosexual, and in ancient times, homosexuals were looked at as the death of their way of life and traditions because they couldn't procreate. Also because it's unacceptable to the ancestor spirits, they won't consecrate any ritual led by a gay person. And this carries on into modern times as this rule still has to be followed. But Adolfo's padrino made him engage in sexual acts during rituals. Once he was older, it's not clear how consensual these acts were. Adolfo continued to have sex with men as an adult. He may have been bisexual, but because he didn't seek out or seem to really enjoy sex with women, it's likely he was gay. Adolfo was raised to be a polero, which obviously would make him a very odd kid. He lived his whole life from the time he was a baby, believing he was the chosen one. He had a strange otherworldliness about him. He was tall and lanky with big eyes, which only added to his strangeness. And he never drank or did drugs. He also didn't fit in with the other kids at all and was often bullied. He even tried shoplifting twice, but was caught almost immediately both times. His mother also practiced dark magic in their home, and her and the padrino taught Adolfo that those who were non believers were lower than an animal. And since one of the main aspects of the religion was animal sacrifice, it was perfectly acceptable to sacrifice these non-believers and use them in rituals. So imagine teaching your child that because you're the chosen one and that anybody who doesn't have the same belief system as you is lower than an animal and therefore is expendable. I mean, that's going to have a major impact on anyone. So it doesn't surprise me that Adolfo goes the way that he does. Because Adolfo was taught not to fear other people, and he wasn't afraid of the police or drug dealers or other criminals, and he wasn't intimidated by anyone, no matter what their status or how much money they had. They were all non-believers to him, and he could use them however he saw fit in order to get what he wanted. The Padrino taught him how to use people to make money, and they would pay top dollar for magical services like healing, protection, and predictions about the future. One of the most important parts of this religion is the Nanga, and this is the vessel used to harness the true power of the spirit world. It's a black iron cauldron filled with spices, coins, insects, blood, bones, and whole animal corpses with a bunch of sticks poking out. But every item in the Nanga has a very specific spiritual purpose. It looks like a random mess, but it's actually highly organized. The 28 sacred sticks in the middle of the mixture are the focus of the Nanga's power and how the spirits communicate and travel. The mixture is divided into three layers, and as the Polero creates these layers, he's creating a powerful living being. And that being needs to be fed in order to keep its power strong. 
different animal sacrifices have different levels of power. And so the padrino taught Adolfo that the most powerful sacrifice was that of a human. But if you feed the Nunga human blood, it will start to crave it. And if you don't keep feeding it human, it will rebel against you. Poleros who use human body parts usually steal them from graves. Some believe that if they feed the Nunga the skull and brains of a fresh corpse, they can actually control the dead body's spirit. So even before learning how to do these rituals himself, Dahlia believed that Adolfo had magical powers like astral projection, ESP, and communicating with the dead. When he was 14, he claimed he had a conversation with Marilyn Monroe who told him she was murdered. Before Ronald Reagan was even running for president, he predicted that someone would try to assassinate him and that he would live. Daly was also a criminal. She was arrested for grand theft, writing fraudulent checks, child neglect, shoplifting, armed assault, and trespassing. And she also had dozens of aliases. So she was always tried as a first-time offender and never jailed for long. What was very clear, though, is that death and decay were a constant presence in Adolfo's childhood home. If his mother got into a fight with a neighbor, she'd decapitate a chicken or a goose, wrap the head in a red cloth, and leave the body and head on the person's doorstep. Adolfo's mother, Dahlia, also taught him to use that stench to help him focus during rituals. So he associated it with power and started to crave it. When he was good, his mother rewarded him with a live animal that he could sacrifice. Daly was kicked out of several apartments, and when she left, the landlords found true horror scenes left behind. The whole place would be covered in blood, animal parts, feces, and whatever was left on her altars. Once when the police were called, they found 27 live animals in the apartment that she was preparing to sacrifice. So Adolfo's living in this type of situation, and he was covered in blood and feces, and pools of congealed blood and piles of garbage were everywhere. Can you imagine living and growing up in an environment like that as a young, young kid? Dude, that's beyond disgusting. <laughs> like, I can't imagine the smell and just how nasty that is. And just like on your mental state. Uh-huh. I mean, you really are going to believe that this is the way, you know, that this is, you know, going to help feed your powers mm-hmm. and, and your abilities. It's, it's brainwashing him pretty yeah. much with the most disgusting things possible. In 1983, the Padrino decided Adolfo was ready for real power. So he performed a ritual to give him power over men's souls and the ability to cast protection spells. And the details of this initiation ritual are highly secretive. But this is how it went, according to Adolfo. There were weeks of preparation. He had to bathe in secret herbs. Sleep for seven nights under a sacred sabah tree and bury white clothes in a fresh grave for three weeks. He then dug up the clothes and wore them around town, smelling like death. He gave daily thanks and offerings to his personal guiding spirit, Kadiem Pembe, Paolo's version of the devil. So literally at this point, he's essentially worshiping the devil. He's a devil worshiper. And during the ritual, he was blindfolded the padrino asked if he was ready for his soul to die, and he answered, My soul is dead. I have no God. He was then brushed with branches of the Saba tree and a live chicken, and the padrino summoned dead souls and then slit the chicken's throat over Adolfo's head. Once he was soaked in blood, the padrino covered the knife in gunpowder and then put it in a fire, which caused a small explosion. He then used the hot knife to carve the scars of the padrino, onto Adolfo's shoulder, as this was his personal signature which was passed down from masters to apprentices. He then removed the blindfold and gave Adolfo a polished human tibia bone. Once he accepted the gift, he was now a Palo Mayumbo padrino, and could take on apprentices of his own and create his own nanga. After this, he started dressing in all white, adding to this mystique. He also liked to wear fancy jewelry and fur coats. And there's a picture of him wearing this exact outfit. And I gotta say, comparing him to somebody like Aleister Crowley, which is like the closest thing I can think of at the moment to this type of situation, obviously way different. Yeah. But Aleister looks a little bit more like, you know, a black magician might look like. Definitely. 
But he just looks like some dude from the 70s, honestly. <laughs> he looks like he's from like Austin Powers or something. <laughs> I right. would not, I would not, if I saw him, uh, you know, if I met him on the street, I wouldn't think this guy is not at all this that evil he's, devil right. worshiping, you know, yeah, madman. Like, I mean, it looks like he's got like some swag going on right there. Yeah, it looks the, like he's about to go to the gay club. Yeah. Which is exactly what he would do. <laughs> He'd be doing all this crazy shit, blood sacrifices, animal sacrifices, thinking about human sacrifice. But yet while he stayed in Miami for a little while, he'd actually go hang out in gay clubs and bars. And he actually enjoyed seducing men and dated women from time to time. But, but what I don't understand though is this guy must smell like fucking shit, dude. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> so, How would anyone want to get near his right. dude? Yeah, I'm sure he just smells of death all the time. Yeah. Especially if those white clothes really were underground for <laughs> fucking three weeks and he's yeah. just rolling around. My God. <laughs> That's a good point. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he smells so bad. But because he was most likely gay, he never brought the women home. And he knew his mother would never think any woman was good enough for him. He also decided that American culture wasn't open enough to magic. So he decided to move to Mexico City in order to set up shop. Once Adolfo was out on his own, he lived very differently than his mother. He always kept his home perfectly clean, except for one room used for his rituals. But he stayed close to his mother. He called her often and always talked to her in the same cringy baby voice he spoke with as a child. And as he started to get more successful, he sent her cash and expensive gifts like fur coats. At first, his services were pretty simple. He gave psychic readings and made predictions about people. And when those predictions came true, they would come back for more. He really knew how to package things and put on a show for people. And once they came back a few times, he introduced dark magic, which he could charge a lot more money for. He also started gaining some followers, and the first was a man named Omar Orea. When Omar was 15 years old, a fortune teller told him he would meet a very powerful man who would change his life and determine his destiny. She said he needed to be ready and beware. And in the summer of 1983, Omar and a friend named Jorge Montes heard about a new magician in town. Jorge was a local psychic who went by Dr. Hindu, and they also heard that this magician was gay, just like them. So they were curious and went in for a reading. Adolfo told Omar, who's about to fulfill the prophecy from his youth, he said an old woman had told him to be ready for this and to be aware. But he assured him he was safe, and Omar answered that he'd been waiting for Adolfo and was instantly hooked. Jorge was a believer too, and he became a follower of Adolfo and use his connections as a psychic to bring him even more followers. It didn't take long for Omar to fall in love with Adolfo. I don't know how that happens. But Adolfo already had a lover, his bodyguard, Martin Rodriguez. But he decided he could have both. He said Omar would be his female lover, and Martin would be his male lover. He pitted the two men against each other and made them dress like women and be his servants. He also beat them when they argued or refused. Adolfo also opened his shop in Zona Rosa, which is an area of Mexico City. And it had a pretty prominent gay scene in an active nightlife. And it was the perfect place to attract more followers. As his reputation grew, he attracted wealthier clients and raised his prices with demand. And actually started charging thousands of dollars per session. Once he proved he was the real deal, his clients became followers of his. And he continued to use their connections to his advantage. One new follower was a real estate broker named Francisco. And he came to Adolfo broke, needing advice. He told him to buy a worthless piece of property with the little money that he had. And after the 1985 earthquake that devastated the city, the government bought the property from him for a huge profit. And after this, he was officially a believer. Francisco then helped Adolfo buy houses and apartments all over the city. Adolfo, though, did get real results with his dark magic. A drag queen named Damiana came to him upset because a club owner refused to pay what he owed. And when she demanded her money, she was beaten severely. And she wanted this beating to come back on the owner tenfold. So Adolfo charged her $500 for the ritual. And he sacrificed a chicken, stuffed the decapitated head into a doll, and then buried the doll in a fresh grave. The chicken corpse was then put on the club owner's doorstep with the threatening letters, all written in blood. And a month later... This club owner was dead from a sudden heart attack. And after this, Damiana was another believer. In 1985, he decided 
it was time for him to make his own nanga. But he wasn't messing around. He started the nanga by feeding it human remains. Him and a few followers dug up a fresh body and then stole the skull, tibia, toes, ribs, and fingers. As he believed these parts would give his nanga intelligence, spirit, and the ability to walk and grip things. He then chose the body of a person who had lived and died violently, which would create the most powerful nanga for evil deeds. He then performed a ritual to transfer the spirit from the skull to himself and then to the nanga. And as the spirit possessed his body, he contorted violently. His face turned red and his body stiffened. He clenched his fist so hard that his fingernails even started bleeding. Omar asked the spirit, do you agree to work for El Padrino? To live in this nanga and to serve him as your master. And the men apparently heard a breathy, terrifying whisper. Yes, I will serve. Adolfo then came out of the trance. They then built the layers of the nanga inside of an iron cauldron using coins for payment, bones from the grave, and dirt from the graveyard, including a roasted turtle, a goat head, spices, railroad spikes for iron, deer antlers, scorpions, a boiled black cat, and coconut shells, and they covered all of it in chicken blood. He then put the 28 sticks in the center. Once inside the Nanga, the spirit was now a Nakisi. And to harness the power of the Nakisi, Adolfo had to bribe, trick, or bargain with it by offering it money, blood, or sacrifices. And the spirit would then empower spells and travel anywhere in the world to do his bidding. I'm not an expert on this stuff by any means, but from what I understand, we're dealing, you know, in other terms, I believe this would be equivalent to summoning a demon is what he's doing here. And it's just using other names for this. And obviously, you know, this is a different religion entirely from Catholicism or, you know, Christianity where we would use terms like angel and demon. But I believe that's essentially what he's doing is he's summoning an evil spirit that he can take control of in order to do his bidding. And in his religion, practitioners believe the spirits have the true power. But Adolfo believed that he was the powerful one, and the spirit was just this tool that he could use to do whatever he wanted. The next day, he gave the Nunga rum, cigar smoke, and blood from a hen and rooster. He then grabbed the tibia bone and antler to physically interact with the spirit and gave it the first assignment. Protect his colt, make them rich, and bring more followers. Within a year, he bought a condo in an upscale neighborhood downtown, and the clients and followers just kept on coming. And now that he was in a much more rich neighborhood, he started attracting wealthier clients. One of these clients was a washed up singer named Oscar Ati, and he hadn't had a hit for three years and was losing his youthful good looks. Oscar couldn't afford Adolfo's $5,000 fee, so instead Adolfo said he'd do a cleaning ritual for free if Oscar brought him some more clients. Apparently the ritual that Adolfo did worked because Oscar's career started thriving. And he ended up bringing Adolfo many more celebrity clients like actors and authors. And at this point, Adolfo had an organized menu of ritual options paired with animal sacrifices. The more powerful the ritual and the rarer the animal, the larger the price tag. Roosters, for example, were just $6. Goats were $30. Bow constrictors were more expensive at $450. And the top level animals were zebras for $1,100. Even a lion cub for $3,100. That's absolutely insane. It is. And with these new menu options, he started attracting a new clientele. Criminals looking for protection and advice. His best customers were drug traffickers. And they needed protection. And had money to spend and liked the violence of the rituals. It wasn't long before he was introduced to some of the major players in the drug world. And these people paid a lot of money for his advice, predictions, and protection. He was almost like a consultant telling them the best time to get the large drug shipments across the border without getting caught. And the drug traffickers would lose millions if their shipments were seized. So paying Adolfo a fraction of that was a no-brainer. He took advantage of this, however, and started charging even more. One drug trafficker alone paid him $40,000 over three years for magical services. And as he attracted more followers, Adolfo increased his inner circle by making the most influential new members into padrinos. It should have taken years of teaching and practice to reach this level and Paolo Mayumbo. But Adolfo wasn't concerned with that. He just wanted more power and more money. He was soon introduced to the head of Mexico's Interpol office, the most powerful law enforcement official in the entire country. 
He was also now providing magical services to the corrupt federal police force in Mexico, which only gave him more inside information that he could use to help the drug traffickers and increase his credibility. It was then that he was introduced to a federal officer named Salvador Alcoron, who worked on the border of Matamoros, Mexico, and Brownsville, Texas. And Adolfo wanted a connection to the city of Matamoros, where the big drug money was. And Salvador was a very scary guy. He had deep scars running down the middle of his face that made it look like he had three different faces. He believed each of his faces was possessed by a different spirit. One was a warrior, one was a murderer, and one was an African witch. And when he met Adolfo, he recognized these three spirits right away and named them. And when Adolfo did this, Salvador was instantly a believer and agreed to aid him. He became his most important inside man with the police as he knew the best times to send drug shipments across the border. Adolfo also used this information to help the drug traffickers and his reputation as a very powerful magician only grew more. And Adolfo definitely believed in his own power. It's likely that he believed his magical power was what allowed him to get this inside information. He then would put a show on for his clients and convince them that he was all-knowing. He wanted to be more than a consultant, though, and asked Salvador to introduce him to potential business partners. And that's how he met the Calzada crime family. This family actually exported fire extinguishers and used them to smuggle drugs. The head of the family was Guillermo Calzada, and Adolfo had to win him over, as he was very wary of trusting a magician. Adolfo used cleansing and protection rituals to help him move large shipments of cocaine undetected. And once he proved that his powers were real, Guillermo was a believer, and together they made a ton of money. And Guillermo started to trust Adolfo with inside information about the drug trafficking business. He was learning how it worked from the head guy. But the more money he made for the family, the more he thought he deserved. So it didn't take long before Adolfo asked Guillermo for 50-50 split of the profits. And Guillermo was like, get the fuck out of here, man. But Adolfo did not take this very well. And he demanded that he get his fair share, but ended up being thrown out. Adolfo felt rejected, just as he had been when he was a boy being bullied by other kids. And at this point, he was just flat out humiliated. He wanted to prove how powerful he was. So he started being even more ruthless, more violent, and more greedy. His followers weren't criminals, but in order to make more money, he needed to use them more. So he manipulated, seduced, and threatened them to get what he wanted. In 1987, him and a few followers dressed up like DEA agents and raided a dentist's office. This dentist happened to be a cocaine dealer and they stole his entire stash. He then ordered his followers to beat up the dentist until he was nearly dead. And with some extra help, he was making more money than ever. He made $100,000 just by smuggling one shipment of cocaine. Soon he decided it was time for Guillermo to pay for his humiliating rejection. So Adolfo told Martin and Omar his plan and convinced them to participate in a new kind of ritual. So first... Adolfo went to Guillermo and told him a rival magician had cast a spell on him that made him ask for the 50-50 split and then freak out. He begged for forgiveness and offered to do a free cleansing for Guillermo and every high-ranking member of his family. Guillermo agreed and gathered his wife, mother, bodyguard, business partner, maid, and even his secretary in his home for the ritual, this free ritual. Adolfo then put them in a circle and started chanting. And as it went on, he started yelling about his enemies and pointing at the family members inside the circle. Then as he raised a machete, Martin and Omar burst into the room with submachine guns. And within seconds, every member of the Calzada crime family was dead. They then cleaned up the scene so well that when the police investigated, they found no evidence that a mass murder had taken place in the home. It just seemed like the family had vanished. But a week later, the mutilated bodies started to wash up on the riverbanks outside of the city. And what they found was absolutely horrific. Toes, ears, and even fingers were cut off. Rolled up $20 bills were shoved into the hands where the fingers should have been. They were also bludgeoned and castrated. And the chests were hacked open and their throats were slit. The secretary's neck cut was so deep she was almost decapitated. 
The hearts were also removed from all the bodies and the spinal cord had been ripped out of one of the bodies. And in addition, brains from two people were missing. And as you can probably imagine, these hacked off body parts and removed organs were then fed to Adolfo's Nanga, which was its first taste of freshly murdered humans. And during the police investigation, Adolfo and his crew were nowhere on the radar. They had gotten away with it and took this as a sign that they could do whatever they wanted. Salvador, the man with three faces, told Adolfo about another potential partner, the Hernandez crime family. Adolfo was looking for a small operation that he could take over. He never messed with the Mexican drug cartels, as he didn't want to be an underling in a big operation. He wanted to command his own. The Hernandez family was very connected to the border town of Matamoros. It was popular with American college students and spring breakers, and there was a lot of potential for an up-and-coming drug smuggler. First, he needed an introduction to the family, and that's when Adolfo brought in Sarah Alderde. And her connection to the Hernandez family was that she had actually dated one of the brothers named Elio. Sarah was from Matamoros, but went to high school and now college in Brownsville, Texas. She was six foot one and extremely beautiful. She met Adolfo in 1987 while driving with her sister. Adolfo had stopped his car in front of her, blocking rush hour traffic. She slammed on her brakes and saw this tall, handsome man, dressed in all white, step out and walk toward her. Adolfo leaned on the hood of her car and told her she had to be with him. He lied to her, though, about his real identity for months, telling her he was an undercover cop. But slowly, he started to show her his powers and win her trust. Sarah had a boyfriend, though, but Adolfo correctly predicted that he would break up with her very soon. When they started jogging together, she noticed that he never sweat or got tired, and Adolfo gave her a reading and predicted that three things would happen. She'd get money to pay for school, an old friend would call her, and an old boyfriend would come to her with a problem. And after this reading, within days, she received a letter from her college that she won a scholarship and a childhood friend called her to come for a visit. Sarah was absolutely shocked that all this was coming true and started to believe that this man may really have some magical ability. When she called him to say his predictions came true, he told her the truth about his powers. And this was all done in order to manipulate Sarah into becoming one of his followers. Because once she was a true believer, he knew that she could help him infiltrate the Hernandez crime family. Adolfo taught her about his magic and initiated her as one of his followers. Sarah kept going to school during the day and practicing magic at night. Her rituals were so intense, she would injure herself contorting her body and would lie to her classmates about what had happened to her. She followed Adolfo's every instruction and also kept everything a secret. Sarah was obsessed with him and Adolfo gave her just enough attention to keep her on the hook. When he found out she had the same birthday as his mother, he knew she was meant to be his follower. And by October 1987, he was in complete control of her life. He told her what to do, where to go, and who she was allowed to talk to. They did have a sexual relationship, but it was infrequent and brief. And when he kissed her, he described it as in a brotherly manner. But it kept Sarah close to him. Adolfo's third prediction to Sarah eventually came true, and her old boyfriend, Elio Hernandez, called her with a big problem. She did as she was told and sent Elio to Adolfo for help. Elio's older brother, Saul, was the head of the crime family and knew everything about the business. But he was murdered, leaving Elio in charge, and he had no idea what he was doing and needed some help. It's possible that Adolfo had Saul killed in order to orchestrate this whole thing, but no one knows for sure. When Elio told Adolfo's problem, he offered his magical services. What he really wanted was to recruit Elio into his group, and he knew Sarah could convince him. So Adolfo decided to give her a higher rank. He performed a ritual where he fed her soul to the devil, making her La Madrina, the godmother and the caretaker of his nunga. He sprayed her with cheap liquor and animal blood and then carved his signature in her shoulder. He declared that her soul was dead and she was now one of them. And her first task in this new role was to convince Elio to join. First she seduced him and then she recruited him into the group. 
Once he was initiated, Adolfo took him out for burgers and fries, which was the group's favorite meal, and they worked out a deal. When Adolfo demanded a 50-50 split, Elio gave it over willingly. Adolfo was in charge of magical protections, and Elio was in charge of running the business and bringing in more followers. And the new members Elio brought in were other criminals and outsiders. The first was Alvaro Valdez, who went by El Dabi, and he was an extremely violent criminal. When he was just 10 years old, he stole his father's gun and shot his neighbors from a tree. And he was very attracted to Adolfo's group because he heard about all the bloodshed and violence. Another new recruit was a man named Mario Torres. And he went by the name El Gato, or the Cat, because he was supposedly very clever. Elio also brought in little Serafine Hernandez, who also went by El Chaparro. And this roughly translates to a short, chubby man. Little Serafine brought even more members. These guys and a few others became part of Adolfo's inner circle. And Adolfo proved his power to them when he predicted that a large shipment would make them rich. And soon, corrupt federales seized a shipment of weed and sold it to the Hernandez family at a big discount. He taught the new members how to perform rituals and even made them swear their allegiance to him and the group. And now, Adolfo was finally ready to test their loyalty through murder. Now, before we get into the real graphic details that come next in the story, I want to take a quick break and thank our sponsors for today. Fresh from San Diego, California comes the only sunglasses brand I'll probably ever wear again. I'm talking about Blender's Eyewear, and you're going to be just as hooked as I am when you see how awesome these shades are. These glasses go for under $50, and I got to say the, the quality of the frames and the lenses are on par with some of the more expensive luxury eyewear brands out there. These are the perfect pair to wear when I'm driving in the car or just taking a walk outside. What's cool is that Chase Fisher started Blenders by selling his beachy shades out of his backpack while doubling as a surf instructor on Pacific Beach. And his goal is to create an adventurous mid-price eyewear option with the same cool factor as other leading styles. And unlike expensive big brand shades that you've probably lost or smashed in the past, Blenders are actually affordable. So you're not going to cry as much when the inevitable happens. So live life in forward motion with Blenders today. To score 15% off your Blenders purchase, visit BlendersEyewear.com and enter code LIGHTSOUTVIP. That's BlendersEyewear.com and use code LIGHTSOUTVIP for 15% off. Blenders is rocked with pride worldwide. Our next sponsor is Stamps.com. Big fan of Stamps.com, been using them for quite a while now. What's great about it is that you can print official U.S. postage 24-7 for any letter, any package, and any class of mail, and anywhere you want to send. And once your mail is ready, you don't have to actually go to the post office to drop it off. You can just schedule a pickup, and you're ready to go. I actually use Stamps.com for my CBD business, Higher Love Wellness, and it's already saved me, gosh, thousands of dollars in postage. What's also great is that stamps.com not only has USPS postage, but they actually give you 62% off UPS shipping rates, which are expensive. So stamps.com is a no brainer. It saves you time and money. And it's no wonder that nearly 1 million small businesses, including mine already use stamps.com. So stop wasting time, go in the post office and go to stamps.com instead. There's no risk. And with my promo code lights out, you get a special offer that includes a four week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. And there's no long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in lights out. That's stamps.com, promo code lights out. With stamps.com, you never have to go to the post office again. And lastly, this episode is brought to you by Every Plate. I love to eat, I also love to cook. And with Every Plate, mm, man, can you make some delicious meals? They got burgers, pastas, they got all types of different cuisines. And what's great about it is that it is super, super affordable with meals starting at just $1.99. If you've never tried a meal kit like Every Plate, they send you a box with all the pre-measured ingredients. It's all fresh and it's whole produce too. Like I was shocked it wasn't just like, you know, an onion cut in half. They send the whole freaking onion. So you can actually use it for future meals as well. And all their recipes come together in just 30 minutes, which is definitely faster than going to the grocery store and planning a whole menu. So if you want to try every plate for just $1.99 per meal, plus you'll get an additional 20% off your next two boxes by going to everyplate.com and entering code LIGHTSOUT199. Get started with every plate today for just $1.99 per meal, plus an additional 20% off another two weeks. 
by going over to everyplate.com and entering code LIGHTSOUT199. So in May of 1988, a new member gave Adolfo a tip. He worked as the foreman at Rancho Santa Elena, and he said that they could hijack a shipment of weed from small-time traffickers at the next ranch over. So Adolfo and his crew hijacked the truck, tied up the two men, and he asked them if they were good Christians. And when the men said yes, Adolfo reminded his followers that Christians were animals. And smiling at the men, he then shot them point blank in the head and said, we sacrifice animals. Most of his followers weren't actually violent people, and they were actually shocked by this cold-blooded murder. They just stood frozen, staring at the dead bodies on the ground. Adolfo then ordered them to bury the bodies, and obviously they quickly obeyed. They passed the test, and he was ready for the next step. He told them that they would murder again, but this time it would be used for a protection ritual and would feed the Nunga. And I hope I'm saying that right. It's it's pronounced, I've multiple pronunciations, Nunganga and Nunga, pretty much the same thing. <laughs> I went off of a Spanish pronunciation, so. I think you're saying it hopefully right. Hopefully I'm saying it right, Nunga. Yeah. But the crew all hung out at a restaurant called Los Sombreros, and Adolfo decided to go there to find their next victim. They kidnapped a rival drug dealer who was hanging outside the restaurant. But in a struggle, El Dubi shot him in the head. Since that didn't work, Adolfo decided that they needed an innocent victim and not to fuck with drug dealers. And that's when Ramon Esquivel, who was an antique dealer and a drag queen, who also went by the name La Claudia, and she had actually dated Dr. Hindu and was still his roommate. But Adolfo never liked her and decided that she was the perfect sacrifice. So Adolfo went to their apartment with a few other members in order to keep La Claudia busy. And back at his place, Sarah was preparing for the ritual. Once it was ready, the group went over, and as soon as La Claudia saw them, they tackled her to the ground and bound her with duct tape. They then forced her into the bathtub, and the drain was already plugged in order to collect all the blood. Adolfo had his followers hold her down while he cut off fingers, toes, ears, and finally, the penis, all while La Claudia was still alive and screaming. He believed causing maximum pain and suffering would make the ritual all the more powerful, but he also enjoyed it. Next, he skinned her alive, cutting her body at key places and then ripping the skin away in large pieces. And finally, he slashed her throat, and she was dead. He then commanded his followers to fill up a jug with all the blood and to gather up the severed body parts. They then cut out her shin bones and even her brain, and they put the rest of the body in garbage bags and buried them. The body parts and blood were then used to create a new Nanga, and this time the Nanga was created with freshly murdered human, which meant it had to be fed to fresh victims. Adolfo used this very reason to justify even more murders, and with each ritual they needed a new victim. They set up this new Nanga in a shed at Rancho Santa Elena in Matamoros. It had to be hidden since it had evidence of the murder. Soon after this, Adolfo set up a deal with cocaine dealers in Texas. He told them he'd sell them a shipment of cocaine for a million dollars, but he really planned to kill them at the handoff and steal the money. But his crew was too slow. The drug dealers figured out that they were being tricked and actually kidnapped Elio's brother, Ovidio, and they demanded their money back and the shipment of cocaine as a ransom. Adolfo told his crew not to worry. They're going to get Ovidio back using dark magic. But first, he needed another victim to sacrifice. So that's when Elio was ordered to find one. And he went out and picked up a hitchhiker, tied him up, and brought him to the shed at Rancho Santa Elena. Adolfo then cut off his fingers, toes, and ears while asking the gods to release Ovidio and crush their enemies. He took a swig of rum and then spit it on the hitchhiker and into the Nunga. And then he performed a ritual rape on the victim. Once he was done, he then used his machete to slice off the top of his skull which finally killed him. And this time he decided to involve his followers one step further. He ordered them to mutilate the body. Adolfo cut out the brain while Elio cut out the heart and the other followers cut away pieces of the corpse and fed them to the Nunga. Adolfo told them that the more they cut, the less they would fear and the more powerful they would become. And it actually worked. When the body was mutilated so much that it barely looked like a person, it was easier for them to keep hacking away at it. 
They then dug a hole and wrapped a piece of metal around the corpse's spine. And they buried the body and left the wire sticking out of the ground. Because later on, they could pull the wire and actually rip out the spine once the body decomposed. Later on, Adolfo actually took Elio to the grave and pulled up the wire. Attached to it was a vertebrae. Adolfo said that this would be made into a necklace and that it would bring him good luck. Elio then cleaned up basically the spinal cord and wore it around his neck. And crazy enough, a video was released by his kidnappers the very next day. And after this happened, all of his followers truly believed in Adolfo's power. And even a video became a dedicated follower of his. Adolfo knew the best way to have total control was to make his followers fear each other and him. So he decided that they would kill one of their own. A member named Valente Gomez was a drug addict. And he was actually caught at one point using their supply. During the next ritual, the group thought they were sacrificing a chicken and a cat. But Adolfo announced that there was a traitor among them who had to be punished. He said this traitor had stolen their drugs and laughed at them behind their backs. Valente took a step back when he said this. And at this point, everyone realized it was him. The group stared at Valente while Adolfo listed all of his charges. And then he walked up to him and said, It's you. And a second later, he pulled out his machete and used the flat of the blade to shatter Valente's jaw. Adolfo then turned to the group and said he had offended the gods and had to die. But this time they were all going to participate. And if they didn't, their punishment would be death. El Duby was already a violent criminal who had killed someone. So he really didn't have a problem with this. And he stepped up first. And the other members followed soon after. While Valente was still alive, they beat him, stabbed him in the chest and stomach, broke his ribs one by one. Adolfo used a hammer to finish him off hitting him so hard in the skull that the hammer became stuck. He then told his followers that this is what happened to the disobedient children of essentially the devil. After participating in this murder, the followers were completely dedicated. Otherwise, they had killed their friend for nothing. They felt invincible and ready to continue to torture and murder for the Nunga. And for the next month, the followers on a murder spree, they murdered at least seven people, but probably much more. The more they fed the Nanga, the more powerful they felt, and the more they believed in their own invincibility. In early 1989, Ovidio and Elio were hanging out at Los Ambros. A small-time drug trafficker named Ezequiel Rodriguez told them his gang had an offer for them. 1,700 pounds of weed for $400,000. El Duby hung around there all the time, bragging about their group and showing people the severed fingers and toes that he kept in his pocket. So this guy should have known what kind of people they were. However, they agreed to set up a meeting with Adolfo at the ranch. And on February 14th, 1989, Ezekiel brought a sample of the weed for Adolfo. And when Adolfo said it was poor quality, Ezekiel got mad and flipped out. The members then took this as an opportunity to attack. So then they bound him with duct tape and dragged them into the shed. They then used tin snips to cut off his fingers one by one, demanding he tell them where the rest of the weed was hidden. As this is happening, he's telling them that it's at another ranch. And Adolfo cut off two more fingers. And even one of his nipples is punishment for not talking right away. After this, though, Ezekiel led them to the other ranch. And once they had the weed, Adolfo forced two random farm hands to dig a grave. He then used a submachine gun to murder Ezekiel and the farm hands and then pushed all of them into the grave. Ovidio, who's still a new member, used a machete to cut open their skulls and remove their brains. The other members then jumped into the grave to slice off the genitals and remove the hearts. And then they took all these body parts back to Rancho Santa Elena and used them to feed the Nanga. And just nine days later, Adolfo announced they needed a new victim. And he said this time, Elia would hold the machete. So they picked up a random person from Los Sombreros and forced him into their car at gunpoint. But when the man screamed, Elio panicked and shot him in the head. Adolfo was angry that the sacrifice was ruined and told other members to go out and find a new victim. So that's when they kidnapped a boy walking along the highway near the ranch. They grabbed him and covered his head in a sack and brought him into the shed where Adolfo and Elio were waiting. Elio was anxious to prove himself and actually had been whipped into a frenzy by Adolfo. As soon as they removed the sack, he raised the machete and swung it to chop off the top of the victim's skull. 
but he aimed too low and actually decapitated him instead. And when he looked at the head on the floor, Aelia realized it was his 14-year-old cousin, Jose Luna. Of course, this shocked Aelio, and he fell to the ground in tears. Adolfo might have ordered his followers to bring back a family member in order to punish Aelio for the shooting the first victim. How fucking brutal and savage is that? Adolfo then used the machete to cut open the boy's head and remove the brain, and he put it into the nunga and told the other members to drain the rest of the blood into the cauldron. Aelio was still a wreck, crying on the ground. Adolfo then told him to cut out the heart, and he would feel much better. So Aelio reluctantly sliced open his own cousin's chest, and as soon as he pulled out the heart, though, he wasn't upset anymore. Adolfo announced the sacrifice would protect them for a while, and that they could take a break from human sacrifice. And when no one came looking for Jose, the followers believed the magic protection was working. Adolfo encouraged his followers by telling them that they're invincible and that bullets couldn't pierce their skin and that they're invisible to the police. He was so worked up, he decided to end their cooldown period and said, you know what? Screw it. It's time for another sacrifice. So he chose a drug dealer who's caught selling cocaine on Hernandez turf and little Seraphine was sent out with three other followers to go and get him. And once they kidnapped him and brought him back to the ranch, this time everyone in the shed participated directly. They took turns slicing off pieces of skin and beating him. And Adolfo raped him and then began skinning him alive. But no matter what they did, he never screamed. He didn't even make a sound. And Adolfo knew the ritual wouldn't work without screams of agony. The Nanga needed suffering and terror. And without that, it wouldn't give them the protection they needed. Plus, Adolfo enjoyed the pain and fear of his victims. He wanted it to be as terrifying and agonizing as possible, and to hear them scream and beg for mercy. After this dealer was dead, he immediately demanded he wanted an American victim. He wanted someone soft, someone who he knew would absolutely scream. And luckily for him, it was spring break time in America. So Matamoros was filled with U.S. college students there to party and take advantage of the legal drinking age, which is only 18 years old. And just for reference, Brownsville, Texas, and Matamoros is literally separated by a bridge. And there's, there's, there's a border there. So you can go easily walk across the bridge to the Mexico side, drink, party, and then walk back home to Brownsville, Texas. So Adolfo sent out little Seraphine, along with three others, to stake out the bridge between Matamoros in Brownsville, Texas. Didn't take long before they spotted a group of young men. 21-year-old Mark Kilroy, who was a student at University of Texas, had come over the bridge to party with a few friends. And they had walked to multiple bars and were all really fucked up. And on their way to the bridge, Mark fell behind his friends. And that's when little Seraphine closed in. Him and another follower asked Mark if he wanted a ride. And once he was in the truck, they told him that they needed to stop at a bar first. Mark definitely felt like something was off. And as soon as they stopped, he actually jumped out of the car and started running full speed towards the U.S. border. But because the followers were all wearing badges and police uniforms, Mark thought they were police. And they actually yelled, freeze, as if they were pointing a gun at him. And so Mark, thinking that these were actual police thinking he was under arrest for public drunkenness, stopped and actually got back in their truck willingly, believing he was being arrested. But sadly, they weren't police, and they bound and gagged him and took him back to the ranch. Adolfo was out of town, so they had to wait for him to get back to do anything. And they actually left Mark Kilroy in the truck bed tied up for a full day. The ranch's caretaker, Domingo Bustamante, wasn't involved in the rituals of Adolfo's group. He was just there to take care of the ranch, but he saw a lot of what went on there. And when he noticed Mark in the truck, he actually felt bad for him. So Domingo took the gag out of his mouth and even fed him some scrambled eggs. And when Adolfo was back, he was thrilled. He had this soft American to sacrifice. And then Mark was taken into the shed with Adolfo, Elio, and Martin. There he was sodomized and castrated while still alive. And then Adolfo sliced off the top of his skull with a machete. They then removed the brain and fed it to the Nanga, and Adolfo said the brain of an American college student would make 
than the Kisi, even more intelligent. He then brought in the other members to mutilate the body. First El Duvi, cut off the legs and piece by piece with the machete. And while he worked, the other members stood around making jokes, as at this point they were completely desensitized to all the violence and gore. El Duvi then cut out the heart with a dagger and fed it to the Nanga, and the other followers ripped out the spine and then buried the rest of the body. And when they were finished, they then went out for burgers and fries, which was their post-ritual dinner. Mark's friends, on the other hand, waited for him for hours, and even went back to Matamoros to look for him. And when they couldn't find him, they reported him missing. And as soon as the media found out, this story blew up and was reported everywhere. And Adolfo didn't expect this much attention. But him and his followers were never mentioned anywhere. So he reassured them that for now they were safe, but they needed another sacrifice soon in order to keep them protected. So their next victim was Sarah's ex-boyfriend, Gilberto Sosa. She met him at school and they dated briefly. And once she met Adolfo, she ditched him. But Gilberto was still trying to pursue her. And this annoyed Sarah, so she told Adolfo. And Adolfo said, you know what? I'll take care of it. So Sarah lured Gilberto to her house where Adolfo was waiting. And he ordered him into his car at gunpoint. And when they arrived at the ranch, his followers were ready. They attacked Gilberto all at once. And he was savagely beaten while pieces of his body were sliced and torn off. And the entire time he was alive and screaming for his life. Elgato was given the honor of cutting his throat to drain the blood. And again, once they were done, they took a break and then went out for burgers and fries. That's how common this was for them at this point. Afterward, they finished the ritual and fed the body parts to the Nanga. And before they could deal with the 1,700 pounds of weed they stole, which were still untouched, Adolfo said they needed one more sacrifice. A man by the name Victor Soseda was friends with the man El Dubi shot outside Los Sombreros nine months earlier. And he knew who killed his friend, and he wanted revenge. When Adolfo found out, he hired two corrupt cops to pick him up and drop him off in an alley. His followers were there waiting, and grabbed Victor. And once he was in the shed, Adolfo said, Welcome to the house of the devil. Your soul belongs to me now. And during the ritual, he cut off his fingers and ears and then castrated him. And then he removed the skin from his face while he was still alive finally slicing open his skull and removing his brain. Again, his body parts were fed to the Nanga, and he announced that they were now protected enough to start selling the drugs. But before they could, things took a turn. One day, little Seraphine was heading back to the ranch and saw a police checkpoint up ahead. Believing he was invisible to the police, he drove right through it. But when the police followed after him, he thought they'd be stopped before getting to the ranch because there was some type of magical barrier that they couldn't cross. But the police drove right on to the ranch, and as soon as they found a statue of a god, they knew they were dealing with some kind of dark magic. They then forced little Seraphine to open the warehouse where they found their drug stash, and everyone at the ranch was arrested on drug charges, but they all believed the magic would continue to protect them. So they just joked around and laughed. But the federal police was very annoyed, and decided to use torture in order to get the Hernandez brothers to talk. They sprayed a mixture of soda water and Tabasco into their noses, which is obviously extremely painful and also made them feel like they were drowning. But the Hernandez brothers wouldn't talk. They then started questioning Domingo, the ranch's caretaker. Domingo had nothing to do with the magic and had no allegiance to Adolfo, so he had no problem talking. He then saw a poster of the missing American student, Mark Kilroy, who he had fed scrambled eggs to. And he told the officers that the American had been at the ranch. And although he didn't witness it directly, he knew Mark had been murdered. Next, the police questioned little Seraphine. And he still believed that they would be saved by magic. So he saw no problem with admitting everything. He told them that they had murdered over a dozen people, including Mark Kilroy. And he was calm and straightforward and even a little amused. And even offered to bring them inside the ritual shed. And once inside, the scene was unlike anything they had ever witnessed before. There was blood everywhere. They saw the metal loops on the ceiling where victims were hung and the tools used to torture and kill them in the center of the room. And the Nanga was filled with bones, human body parts, including organs and blood. The police had no interest in messing around with dark magic, so they called in a wizard to exercise the shed. 
Little Seraphine then led them to Mark's body, the wire connected to his body still sticking out of the ground. They then exhumed him and 14 more mutilated bodies which were buried all over the ranch. And Little Seraphine then just kept leading them to more and more bodies, laughing the entire time. Because he still believes that this magic protection is going to keep them from getting in trouble. But then the police started arresting other members of the group. Ovidio managed to slip away long enough to warn Adolfo, and he then took Sarah, Martin, and El Duby in Elgato on the run with him. They crossed the border and then checked into a Holiday Inn in Brownsville, and Adolfo called his mother from the room. And in the baby voice he used with her, he said he was on the run, but that he was innocent. And at this point, the media coverage was now out of control. The American media immediately blamed the whole thing on devil worship, and even Geraldo Rivera and Oprah both did specials focusing on Satanism. And this was when the group was labeled Los Narcos Satanicos, or the Satanic Drug Dealers. Adolfo fled to Mexico City with most of the group, but Elgato was caught. Living up to his reputation as a clever one, he convinced the police that he was a college student and had nothing to do with any of it. And he was actually released and never seen again. Meanwhile in jail, the members were waiting for magic to save them and still laughing and joking the entire time. And obviously the police are fed up with these guys. They're just laughing, making a mockery of everything. So one of the police officers actually fired an AK-47 rifle right next to Elio's head, which burst his eardrum. And after this, he was willing to talk. And he gave the police all the addresses for Adolfo's homes across Mexico. And as officers raided each home, what they found was broadcast on TV, including the ritual rooms and nangas filled with blood and bloody body parts. And at this point, Sarah started to freak out. She claimed she had no idea the extent of what was going on. She knew Adolfo killed people, but she thought they were all drug dealers. Adolfo didn't allow women to be a direct part of the rituals but she was right there before and after. So it's very hard to believe she had no idea what was going on. Adolfo made a plan for them to escape to Central America where they could start over, but their pictures were all over the news at this point. So they all had to change their haircuts and hair colors. Adolfo cut his long hair, dyed the rest red, and started wearing Hawaiian shirts. Salvador, the man with three faces, brought them weapons, an Uzi and a shotgun, and ammunition. And they stayed in multiple hotels all over Mexico City, never staying in one place for too long. And Adolfo continued to set up altars and perform minor rituals in each place to keep them protected. And when the Mexican authorities couldn't find them, the FBI decided to step in. And they had a plan to flush him out, using his own beliefs against him. They consulted with an anthropologist who told them they weren't dealing with Satanism. It was Paolo Mayumbo. And the cauldron of body parts was Adolfo's nanga the most important thing in the world to him, and the source of all of his power. So they decided to kill the Nanga, hoping it would make Adolfo so upset he would panic and make a mistake. So they got some help from a Karandra, which is like a healer or a shaman, and brought him to the ranch. And on camera, the Karandra covered the ritual shed with gasoline and then lit it on fire, and the entire shack burned to the ground. But the Nanga was still standing untouched, they then dragged it into a field, emptied it, and lit all of the contents of it on fire. And the Corandria then released a white dove. And if the white dove lived, that meant the ritual worked, and the Nanga was dead. And this dove they released did live, which meant the ritual was a success. El Duby saw the coverage on TV two days later, and he cried out, and Adolfo rushed in. And when he saw what was happening, he screamed for an hour straight, and smashed everything in the room. And when he lost his voice, he kept screaming in a hoarse whisper. And without the Nanga to protect him, he carried his Uzi everywhere and started planning a suicide pact for the group. He told them they'd be reborn and would find each other again. However, Salvador talked him out of it, and he proposed a plan to get Adolfo to Guatemala, and there they would all have plastic surgery in order to change their appearance. So Sarah was sent out to meet with a plastic surgeon. He immediately recognized her and refused to get involved. And at this point, she decided that, you know what, I'm done with all this as well. So she started talking to police on the street, hoping they'd arrest her. But none of them recognized her. She then went back to the hideout and threw a note out the window with the address and a message that said a woman was being held hostage. And if the police didn't come, a colt would kill her. She waited again, but nothing happened. 
The police had heard reports of her wandering the streets, so they set up stakeouts outside a few shops where they thought the group might get supplies. One of the stakeouts happened to be across the street from the hideout. And Adolfo saw the police vehicle out the window, and he screamed, This is it! And grabbed his gun. He then shot at the police car with the Uzi, and El Duby used the shotgun. The officers weren't hit, and luckily they weren't in the car at the time, but they returned fire. Adolfo threw wads of cash out the window and screamed, This is for you, poor animals. Take it. As people gathered around to gather the cash, he shot a propane tank nearby. He thought it would explode, but nothing happened. The police cleared away the crowd and called for backup. Adolfo ordered Martin and Omar to burn all the money and told El Duby to give him the rest of the ammo. El Duby said there was only two magazines left. And at this point, they were completely surrounded and out of options. So Adolfo announced it was time to die and promised they'd be reunited in the next life. He then took Martine into a closet and they huddled together and he ordered El Duby to shoot both of them and then basically kill themselves afterwards. So El Duby emptied a full clip into the closet, instantly killing Martine and Adolfo. But no one ended up killing themselves. He then fired the last magazine into the sidewalk outside and waited for the cops. And the police stormed the room and then arrested Sarah and Omar. El Duby truly believed he was still protected by the magic and that Adolfo would rise from the dead. But when he was shown Adolfo's headless body in the autopsy room, he gagged and broke down crying, finally accepting that El Padrino wasn't coming back. The Mexican officials brought the three of them out for multiple press conferences and El Duby and Omar talked about the rituals and magic, but Sarah stayed quiet. She continued to maintain her innocence and said she was tricked into joining this death cult. And in 1989, the Los Angeles Times reported that she confessed to conspiracy and was involved in the murders. Investigators reported that she seemed to have three separate personalities, an innocent honor student in front of the cameras, a sadistic witch with investigators, and a third personality which she talked to herself. 14 of Adolfo's followers were indicted on charges of murder, weapons and narcotics violations, conspiracy, and obstruction of justice. El Gato was the only one who got away. Omar was convicted but died of AIDS before being sentenced. And before he died, he said the religion would live on because there are a lot more members out there, including a temple in Monterey. And Martin's sister told police that Adolfo's first La Madrina was still practicing dark magic somewhere in Guadalajara. But in the end, Adolfo's group, his death cult, killed at least 20 people. But investigators believe that there could be up to 100 or more victims still out there. So that is the absolutely terrifying, gruesome story of Adolfo Constanzo. And I just want to say this story scares me to death on wanting to travel out of country because it's really shown me like how cautious you really do have to be in like foreign areas. And there could be like people still out there today yeah. that could be doing types of shit like this. And it's just sad. It's horrifying. And yeah. you know what happened to all these victims? Like, you know, that is, this one was just so hard to, to listen to, you know? Yeah. It's, it's it's really mind blowing. I mean, this sounds like something out of a horrible horrible movie or uh-huh. something. It's crazy that this was real life and that there are people out there that do do these kinds of things that do th- practice black magic, human sacrifice. I mean, it goes back thousands of years. This type of thing has been going on where people believe that you know, through human sacrifice you do gain this immense power, you know, over you know, yourself and the rest of existence, but I think the big question here is whether or not Adolfo really was, you know, possessed magical ability because it seems like he did have some sort of psychic abilities. It's, I mean, there was times where he would do things, he would perform rituals and then Mm -hmm. things would happen soon after, just as he had predicted. Exactly. And it's hard to tell though. I mean, he had plenty of examples, but it is hard to tell if it did just happen by coincidence or if he did have like a true ability. Because, I mean, for all we know, it could have just been, 
made up. You know, these uh-huh. people are just making shit up to go along with what he was saying. But it, it does seem like to some extent there was some sort of magical ability here. But instead of, you know, he could have used that for good and help people and predict, you know, do what most psychics do and be like, oh, you know, this might happen or, you know, look sure. out for this. Yeah. But instead he decided, you know, he took the greedy approach and decided, you know, I'm going to use this power for evil and for my own, you know, my own gain. And that's exactly what he did at the expense of all these, you know, innocent victims that, uh-huh. or, you know, not so innocent victims. But when it comes to the drug dealers and everything else, I just think that, you know, he he totally got carried away with it. And obviously all of the animal sacrifice from a young child and being in gruesome scenarios like that right. early on definitely had an effect. I mean, it desens- it would desensitize anyone to blood and gore. I mean, to us, we're all horrified when we hear all this. We hear him taking brains out, cutting tops of head. We're mm-hmm. like, oh, my God. But he was doing this but to him, it's, day in, day out. Like, they're animals. I mean, he's yeah. equating humans to animals and has lowered them to you know what's lower than an animal what mm-hmm. a bug an insect yeah so or virtually nothing which is a very scary place to be i mean this guy was very very scary mm-hmm. when you're when you're able to get your mind to a place where you're like there is no you know no one else matters but me and right. my followers i mean that type of cult is going to be is not going to yeah. end well i mean master manipulator and you know just the brainwashing just unreal uh you know just all of his followers could obey what he says like i get he used fear as a tactic but it it, went beyond fear it went beyond fear it was fear violence and i i think these people really believed he did have this magical ability i think he was psychic in a sense and and whether or not these rituals worked i don't know i mean it i guess it depends on what you believe when it comes to to rituals and magic and everything. I mean, I, I think that's very subjective and everybody has a different opinion on it. A lot of people think it's a bunch of bullshit, but I mean, magic and just rituals in general, if you look at history, has been performed since the beginning of time. Yeah. I mean, you can go back to all sorts of ancient cultures. I mean, I believe it was the, it was either the Mayans or the Aztecs that, or maybe it was both that mm-hmm. did human sacrifice, you know, to deities and things like that. So, this isn't a new concept. I think it just is mind blowing when you bring it into a more modern yeah, sense. That's a you good know, point, we're talking, right? You know, back in the day, people did this all the time, and yeah. nobody bat an eye at it. This was just kind of part of the the culture and part of their religion and their belief system. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. I, I I'm really on the fence when it comes to magic and rituals. I think it's all very interesting, and obviously. There's lots of people out there that use magic and spells and rituals for positive right. things and for bettering yourselves and being a better human and helping others and things like that. And I think that's that's all super great and wonderful. And you know, those that are out trying to pursue, you know, a higher higher version of themselves, I think go for it. If spells, rituals, and mm-hmm. things like that help you, then great. Yeah. But then on the other hand, there's people out there that you know, as we've covered in other episodes of these sites. You know, these satanic cults that, you know, do things like this where they're now bringing human and human body parts and yeah. blood into the to play. I think that's where that's where it becomes very, very, you know, well, expect especially incorporating all the pain and torture, right? Because the fear and all of that into it and how uh-huh. that enhances it makes it more powerful. I think it's just I mean, it's it's fucking evil. It but, is. But it's it's also it's also disturbing because I think it's giving people just a reason or excuse to commit evil acts because they are just an evil person i mean at the very root of this adolfo is a serial killer Mm -hmm. on top of being a cult leader and you know black magician i mean he's he's a serial killer and he gets off he does just like any other serial killer out there right on killing other people torturing them and that's that gives him that release Mm -hmm. that he needs so he literally came from basically a family of killers serial yeah. killers when you right. look at it whether right. you're killing animal i mean an animal's a living thing yeah so animals suffer too so yeah it's the same thing exactly I mean, animals just pretty much same as a human in my my eyes but, yeah but yeah that's the horrific story of adolfo constanzo hopefully <laughs> this was interesting I, it's it's a wild story I I would I don't even know if they'd ever be able to make a movie out of this. This would be a terrifying movie. Oh yeah, probably be fucking 
at least rated R, if not NC-17, if you really were yeah. to put all of this in here. No way I'm watching it, though. No. Oh, fuck that. No. Just, <laughs> yeah. just, you know, telling the story alone was enough to, like, put a mental image in my head. Oh, yeah. I'm sure it did in yours as well. So. For sure. So we'll go ahead and wrap up today's episode there. Uh, if you found this episode interesting, I, don't, I hate to say enjoyed it, uh, definitely give us a thumbs up. Make sure you're subscribed on Apple Podcasts and YouTube. Let us know your thoughts on Adolfo or if you've ever heard this story before. It'd be interesting if you're from uh, you know, the Mexico-Texas border, if you've heard of this before or you remember seeing this on the news even. I'd be really interested to hear from you. But yeah, with that being said, we'll see you next week and Lights Out, everybody.